Welcome everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast, where I look to distill the best practices and best ideas of the world's most successful families and their family offices. I hope to provide thought-provoking opinions and feature amazing thought leaders to our listeners of the podcast with an eye towards the future of the family office. Today's podcast is titled Adam Robinson on the financial markets and decision-making during the crisis, black swan events. Judging from that title, it gives you it gives away who our special guest is. That would be Adam Robinson. Adam Robinson was born in New York City and grew up in Evanston, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. He attended the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School before receiving a degree in jurisprudence from Oxford University. After graduating school, he became one of the two co-founders of the Princeton Review. His first book, originally entitled Cracking the System, the SAT, remains the only test prep book ever to become a New York Times bestseller. Robinson currently advises the heads of large hedge funds, family offices, and other financial institutions on all global asset classes, global equities, U.S. sectors, bonds, currencies, and commodities, using a unique approach that combines game theory, systems thinking, Bayesian analysis, and behavioral economics to outthink global markets and anticipate where major trends will occur. Robinson is a rated chess master, having been awarded a life title by the United States Chess Federation. He lives in the Tribeca neighborhood of Manhattan. Adam Robinson, welcome so much. It's been too long. It has, Angelo, way too long. And to give people a little bit of context, I got introduced to Adam probably about four to five years ago. We met several times, and I always found him to be incredibly insightful. Uh, he spoke at about two or three family office association events, and I believe was the subject of my podcast number two going back about two and a half years ago. So it's great, especially, unfortunately, during the challenging times of the COVID-19 and these kind of conversations, because who knows when someone may listen to this podcast months or years in the future, this is an example where it's important to give the framework of we're talking on Thursday, April 16th, and we're obviously in the midst and challenges of the corona crisis as I am talking. Uh, Adam, let's jump right into the current market conditions and to help start this discussion, there seems to be two schools of thought between my family offices. One is the U.S. government has fired so many financial bazookas that nothing will fail. And this is potentially a great buying opportunity. The other camp believes that we'll head into not just a recession, but probably a depression, and it will take many, many years to recover. And who will pay for all of this? Yes. Well, first, you know, those are, those are two camps of thought. And I, I never state what I think. I only state what I know. And let's take a look at what we know about the world. And I, there's so many vectors that we can enter this discussion with. And I, I want to start with something that Ray Dalio said on November last year, November 6th. And Ray uh, as all of you know, is the head of Bridgewater, the world's largest hedge fund. And on November 6th, he had a blog piece entitled, The World Has Gone Mad and the System is Broken. I, I want to underscore that. The world has gone mad and the system is broken. And, and, uh, and by that he meant that the world didn't compute. And, and it still, in a sense, doesn't compute if you're looking at it through a lens of, of old models. We are in extraordinary times, and it's not just the COVID uh, uh, um, uh, virus. It's, it's, it's not just the coronavirus whatsoever. The coronavirus has merely exposed the fragility of a system that's, that's mm, in the early stages of a, of a of an ongoing deflation. The deflation has gone on for some time. 
the legendary investor, Sir John uh, Templeton said, the four most dangerous words in investing are this time is different, unless this time truly is different. And what Ray Dalio was referring to is any number of outliers. And we can, we can state categorically this time is different because of, of, of one factor, negative interest rates. And, and why are there negative interest rates? And people, when they, when they hear about negative interest rates, they kind of shake their heads. They go, oh, that's weird. I don't understand negative interest rates. And, and the more important question is, in what kind of world do we live in which negative interest rates is a viable feature of the world? Um, again, so you understand, in the world of negative interest rates, in the Alice in Wonderland world of negative interest rates, borrowers are paid to borrow. Lenders pay for the privilege of lending. Think about that. In a world with negative interest rates, borrowers are paid to borrow. That's how bad things are. So with economists lowering interest rates um, and have pretty much, interest rates have been in a secular decline for the last 30 years. You got to think about that. They've been in decline for 30 years. And there are many things that occurred 30 years ago that we need to understand today. So I'm going to start by giving you mm, the real challenge in the world. And that's this. We're going to start at 100,000 feet. The engine of the global economy since since at least the end of World War II, so the last 75 years, I'm sure I've got that right, last 75 years, has been the willingness of the US consumer to go into debt to buy things he didn't really need. The American dream, I want what mom and dad had, I just want more of it. So, and again, the willingness to go into debt to buy that, buy the American dream. And that's a dream we exported to the rest of the world. So if this sounds theoretical, it's very important you pay attention to the next few minutes because you're not gonna understand what's going on in the world today unless you understand uh, the prologue, the last 75 years. So the American dream, I want what mom and dad had, I just want more of it. If they lived in an apartment, I want a home. If they had a home, I want a larger home. In fact, I want two and two cars and two of everything. And, and we went into debt to make that happen. Now debt, debt is okay as long as you can grow your way out of it. And so there are only two sources of growth in the world, population growth and consumption growth. So again, our equation now is debt is okay if we can grow, which means we need one, population growth, and two, we need uh, consumption growth. And, you know, for 30, 40 years, that, that happened. But what happens when they both go negative and accelerate to the downside? So if I buy a home um, and I take out a mortgage, I'm okay with that. In fact, I can even spend some of the money that I borrow against the home because I know the value of the home is going to go up. I know this. Well, I say no because it's actually not the case. Housing prices can go down for decades. In fact, they can go down for centuries if you study history. So people think, well, real estate always has to go up in value, doesn't it? After all, population keeps increasing. There's a fixed amount of land in the world. So ergo, real estate values have to go up. Again, what happens when population growth goes negative? I don't mean the growth goes negative. I mean population contracts. Angelo, this year in the United States, as well as Canada, all countries in Europe, uh, Australia and Japan, more people will die this year than be born. Uh, by the way, that was true last year. I'm not, that's not because of the coronavirus. I mean, 
populations in those countries are shrinking. More people are dying than being born. And that's a huge problem. Remember, debt is okay as long as we can grow. But what happens when we don't? What happens if it accelerates to the downside? And anyone who, family members who have younger, you know, next gen, really, even if you just have friends, anyone you know under the age, say, of 35, how many young people are racing to get married and have kids? Very few. To put a number on that, a generation ago, the, the amount of US real estate owned by Americans under the age of 35 was 31%. And that's about what you'd expect, right? Young families starting off, um, buying a home, growing. Right now, the number is 4%. Americans under the age of 35 own 4% of total real estate. That's a collapse. And, and if you don't, if you're not going to get married to have kids, you don't really need a home. And if you don't need a home, you don't need a lot of the big ticket items for that home. You don't need furniture and a refrigerator. And uh, you certainly, these days, you don't really even need a car. And so all of these things are collapsing. And mm, this is a huge problem. And this is, by the way, before coronavirus. The coronavirus just exposed the fragility of the system. That's all it did. And so, um, again, last year, before the coronavirus hit, Americans under the age of 35 own 4%. Of, of the total value of real estate in, in, in the United States. Now, the problem is gonna happen also for the baby boomers. I was talking about millennials and Gen Zs. The baby boomers, the front end of which, say 75, they're retiring and looking to downsize. So they're looking to sell their big home and downsize, I don't know, to a condo next to a golf course or something they're not going to find millennials interested in buying their homes. And again, we see this, we saw all of this leading up to the coronavirus. So this is a huge problem. And, you know, family members just, it's hard to relate to, to the day-to-day the -day existence of the average American. Again, last year, before the coronavirus, 48% of Americans had zero dollars in their bank account, as in zero, not a little bit. They had nothing and were literally living paycheck to paycheck. Um, and another 21%, so if we add the two numbers, 69% of Americans had less than $1,000 in their bank account. Imagine. And that's during a full employment economy with the stocks at all time highs. This is, was a big problem. So the coronavirus just exposed the fragility of that system. All of a sudden now, people um, in what's largely for many Americans, a gig economy and a service economy, now are left at home with no source of income. That same 48% have zero dollars in the bank. Imagine what they're going through right now. And, and what, what this is going to do, this is, a, again, beyond the coronavirus, it's we're going to see permanent changes in consumption by individuals who are going to learn over the next few months they don't need a lot of things. And by the way, businesses are going to learn that they don't need as many workers as they thought. This is double-edged bad for, for, for the United States. So that's the state of the world. And that's why we have negative interest rates. We have negative interest rates because even when we pay borrowers to borrow money, it's still not... Mm, goosing demand because we are in the early stages of 
of, of a population collapse, which is spilling over to, um, to every other aspect of our economy. So that's, that's it from 100,000 feet. And we can drill down on any level, Angelo. But that's, so when people say, you know, this is, this is just a buying opportunity. This is, everything's gonna go back to normal once we get past this. Um, are, are not students of the larger macro trends that are going on. Um, the US stock market, again, to put some perspective on this, the US stock market on February 19th was at all time highs. And in a month, four weeks later on March 23rd, it had fallen by a third. That's the large cap stock. Average small cap stock was down about 45%. And, and global equities equally bad, the fastest drop in history. And, and so, the, again, those who think things are gonna go back to normal are, don't understand the longer term picture. And, and when I say stocks, it's important to, to distinguish between, There are really two groups of stocks, winners and losers. And my theme, Angelo, since the first time I came on your, on your podcast and, and your, your, your meetings, is that we are in a low to no growth world. And in a low to no growth world, by the way, it's not even low growth anymore, it's contracting. In a low to no growth world and certainly negative growth, capital will flow to the winners. And so, in all sectors, those companies that dominate will continue to dominate. And so I just did a study this morning for my clients. Um, this is really startling. Um, in the last four days, to give you an example, um, NASDAQ stocks are up as of this morning, or they were at least about an hour or two ago, last time I looked, Hold on, I got to do this from memory. They were up, oh, in the last four days, since Friday's close, up 5%. Small cap stocks were down 7%. NASDAQ stocks, up 5 Small cap stocks, down 7 That divergence is a, is a multi, it's a five standard deviation outlier. It has only occurred to that degree or close to that degree 11 times in the last 20 years all of them during bear markets um, during um, the 2000 to 2003 bear market and the 2007 to 2009 bear market and now where you've got strong stocks the nasdaq tech stocks going higher small caps going opposite directions and that's the world we're in right now. That's not just stocks, that's the economy. It's a bifurcated economy. The, the winners are doing very well and the losers keep doing worse. Um, so I know that's been a long-winded um, uh, view from 100,000 feet, but you gotta understand that that's why this time is different. The coronavirus is just the trigger. So I promise to keep my next answers shorter. <laughs> that creates a devastating picture, which could be very challenging. Let me comment and go right into a question. And it's what you noted. The stock market hit a low on March 23rd and mm -hmm. has had a choppy recovery since. Mm -hmm. The news changes by the minute with COVID-19. Rapidly rising unemployment, you think would have even more of a negative impact on the markets, but they appear to have gone a little bit numb potentially on the surface to bad news. Do you advise that families of wealth be tactical and aggressive traders in and out, as opposed to long-term static strategic allocation, which many family offices have adhered to, which won't hedge or take advantage of market dislocations? The part two of that, what do wait, you- Wait, 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 that's a long question. So can't give me a part two. Just, okay, let's go with the part. I've already one. forgotten the part. Okay, so the part one is, is, is do you, do you deal with this tactically in the short term, or you just maintain your 
positions. Yes. And, and so, so by the way, most of my clients are leveraged. They're heads of very leveraged hedge funds. So they can't afford, you know, they can't afford to ride these things out, but I'm just going to deal with the long-term implications. So again, the winningest stocks will do, will outperform the losing stocks. The, the, the million, the billion dollar question is, are even the winning stocks going to be dragged down? So, so if you want a, um, one way to look at it is if the market's going to be higher X months or X years from now, which stocks are going to be leading that? And, and if one were, so for example, a retail portfolio, if one were long, this isn't investment advice, check it out with your financial advisors and your, your chief investment officers. But if one were long a basket of Amazon, Shopify, Walmart, and Costco, you've got a, a nice basket that represents consumer discretionary spending, US consumer uh, staples spending, um, and the tech aspects of Amazon and Shopify. And that portfolio, those four, that group is up, as of yesterday, it was up about 16, 17% year to date. Um, while the market was down, uh, I don't know, 18%. Um, and that's the large caps. So if we, that's a basket, that basket of winning stocks in the retail uh, sector um, is, is going to outperform small cap retailers. XRT is the ETF for, for small cap retailers. I think small cap retailers are down year to date about 30%. So look at the net difference. The winning stocks in retail, Amazon, Walmart, Costco, um, Shopify, are up, up 16% year to date. The average retailer down 30. That's a net difference of 46% in three and a half months. That's extraordinary. And again, the difference long short is the winners will keep winning. And I say it's very important you understand that because if you if you listen to old old school investment advice, they'll say, yeah, but those stocks are overvalued. And the value stocks, let's buy value stocks. These are undervalued. And the <laughs> here's another uh, I, I, I spoke before about NASDAQ stocks rising and, and small caps falling, we see the same divergence with growth stocks versus value stocks. Growth stocks up, value stocks down. Last four days, growth stocks were up about two or three percent from last Friday, value stocks down four, net difference six percent. That's occurred only six times, six other times in the last 20 years, all of them during bear markets. And, and so the winningest stocks will keep winning, the growth stocks. If you're a strong company growing, you're going to continue to grow. You'll still outperform, even if you were to shrink a bit, you're still going to outperform all the value stocks. The, the performance of growth versus value is near all time highs with no end in sight. So the way to invest, if you're simply going to remain long is to be long the winningest stocks, the winningest companies. By the way, that's Warren Buffett's lifetime investing approach. You buy the best companies you can at the best price you can get them at. It, it's hard to get a great company at a great price. Um, but if you, if you had to decide between the two, it's more important that you get the great company at a fair price um, than that you get a fair company at a great price. Go for the great companies. That's really important. 
then you don't have to be quite as tactical. And those who think that um, you know the, the the market is oversold, the again, the the average small cap is down. I don't know what forty as of yesterday or day before about forty five percent year to date. Extraordinary. Um, so so yeah, I, it's difficult for family offices to be as tactical day to day as as a hedge fund. But if one wanted to buy and hold, buy and hold the best companies. And you effectively answered what was going to be the part two, which by the way, that question was, what do you believe to be the best macro sector or thematic trades currently? But effectively, you did answer that. Well, I didn't actually, you said sector. So I'll, I'll talk about that. And and because I, I talked about, you're exactly right, Angelo, about, about in the quality of the stocks, growth versus value, large cap versus small. But in terms of sector, we're in a deflationary world. And, and in a deflationary world, with interest rates declining, um, then certain sectors are on the winning side of that, certain sectors on the losing. The sectors that are on the winning, the cyclicals, basically it's tech. Um, and, and a basket of, of the defensive sectors but among cyclicals, tech. Here, sectors gonna do very badly and have done very badly in a deflationary environment with interest rates declining. Um, financials, energies, materials, and uh, industrials. They're gonna do very badly on a relative basis. Um, and they have done very badly. I, I forget, like energy stocks down, I forget, like 60, 70% year to date, year to date. Uh, financials getting crushed, industrials getting crushed. Um, so the sectors that are most likely to win in, and they've been winning and continue to win, are tech um, and U.S. consumer-centric uh, 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 companies, the strongest, best companies. Um, and then, you know, say a basket of, of some defensives, staples, utilities, and healthcare. You've uh, been public since your well known podcast with Tim Ferriss several years ago with some key indicators that you use. And by the way, your Twitter, which is among the best Twitter reads possible. I highly recommend that everyone look up Adam Robinson. I am Adam Robinson uh, on Twitter. It's fantastic. And you have spoken at this at my events before, but since you have come somewhat public with it, uh, there are certain key indicators that you look at, one being 10-year yields and the other being the interplay of copper comparative to gold. If we yes. could do a deep dive into this, my audience would love sure. to hear more. Sure. So, so here's the thing, you know, my clients ask me and they forget, they go, Adam, what are your views? <laughs> and I always remind them they're not my views. They're the views of, of the, of market participants. So John Maynard Keynes said successful investing is anticipating the anticipation of others, right? We just have to figure out what others are going to think before they think it. And if we were to rank we look at the market, the market. There are different participants. There are stock traders and bond traders, currency traders, metal traders, energy traders. And if we were to rank them in descending order of, of um, foresight and accuracy, stock traders are, are third out of five. They're number three. Above stock traders are bond traders. And above bond traders are metal traders. Metal traders are the farthest sighted and most accurate about the use in the global economy. And on, on, on Tim's podcast, uh, it was at the 92nd Street Y, uh, December 2016, I, I revealed one of my favorite indicators, which is copper divided by gold. Not copper, copper divided by gold. And that is the best predictor of interest rates. It's a leading predictor. And so, so when 
when metal traders think the world is doing is going to do well, they ask themselves one question: Are people buying copper? And and think of metal traders as the forced gumps of the investing world. And if people are buying copper, that's good. I guess the global economy is doing well. And if they're not, that's bad. And so metal traders, when they believe that things are picking up, they will buy copper and sell gold. They will do both. Buy copper, sell gold. And the ratio of the two moves in lockstep with US 10-year yields. Lockstep. And not just US 10-year yields, with global risk. And, and anytime metal traders and bond traders disagree about the direction of interest rates, the metal traders are right and early. In April of 2018, two years ago, I was at a conference. I was the keynote speaker at Evercore, New York. And, um, as the, and I said at that conference, US 10 year yields were about 3%. And at this conference, again, the top financial institutions you know, in New York and elsewhere, I stated that, um, that US 10 year yields were, were going to plunge big time. And again, US 10 year yields were about 3%, and everyone thought they were going higher. And uh, I'm not going to say whom. But a former U.S. Treasurer, a uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, was in the audience next to a friend of mine, and uh, and he said, "Who does this guy think he is?" He leaned over and whispered to my friend, not knowing that he was he. My friend knew me, and my friend said, "Someone you should listen to." And right now, U.S. ten-year yields are uh, what six tenths of a percent, and falling. And I stated that publicly two years ago, and. So copper, and I knew that because copper divided by gold was plunging. So all I knew is metal traders were freaking out about the state of the global economy. And, and when metal traders freak out, then I know what to do. Um, I, I know that interest rates are, are, are plunging. So, so the, that's the best indicator. If someone said, Adam, you can only watch one indicator for markets, I'd say copper divided by gold. Take a look at that chart. It's at all time lows, all time lows. And which means interest rates are at all time, are, are going to stay at all time lows. Uh, by the way, if interest rates go higher from here, and by interest rates, I mean 10 year yields, then we're, we're in for a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble. Um, uh, it'll mean that that bond holders, investors, are not going to accept low interest rates. And if they start to dump bonds as well as stocks, uh, you know, the last time we saw that was like in the in the in the stagflation period in the in the um, in the seventies. That's going to be. I hope that doesn't happen, because um, then things are are way worse than they are even now. Um, so, so yeah. So copper divided by gold. The other one to watch is um, investment grade bonds relative to treasuries. So uh, the ETFs for that are LQD and IEF. So LQD divided by IEF is, uh, is basically it's the credit spread of investment grade bonds. And if you think stock traders were freaking out on March 23rd, bond traders had freaked out. Stocks were at three-year lows. LQD relative to IEF, investment grade bonds, they were 10-year lows. Bond traders, bond traders are, are mm, ruthless number crunching machines and they were at 10-year lows where stocks were only at three-year lows. So if you, if you follow ETFs, the ETFs for copper divided by gold, it's um, DBB is the ETF, DBB divided by GLD. Um, and just watch, if you just watch two things, watch those two. Um, I'm going to give everyone another indicator to watch, another correlate for the global coronavirus issue, and that's 
Jets, J-E-T-S, that's the ETF, divided by VT, um, which is the total global uh, uh, equity stock market, to global. And, um, and that's also near, that's, that's at multi-year lows. So the coronavirus threat is still there. It's not going away anytime soon. Um, so, so those two indicators, Angelo, thank you for, for asking me, are, um, are, are, are saying th there's no bounce here. Again, stocks can bounce, but until metal traders and bond traders um, are, are, um, are bullish, um, we, we have further downside likely. It wasn't during what we're going through now with a black swan event like COVID-19, but in looking over some of your Twitter, you basically said that what you just described as copper uh, divided by gold and the effect on 10-year notes and interest rates, that really most everything else was just noise. You were, yes. it, it, that has not changed given the addition of the black swan of the COVID-19. Well, you know, it's funny you say black swan. And, and in, I mean, in a sense, it is black swan, although it's very clear that, uh, you know, in China, they knew about it in early December of last year. I mean, that's real clear. And uh, so, so it, it, you could say it was a black swan outside there. Black swan events are... Here's the thing about black swan. I, I don't actually believe in black swan events um, because somebody spots the risk before everyone else, uh, often because the people involved are, um, are participating in the black swan event. So, so someone somewhere is gonna spot risk or opportunity before everybody else. So the market may view it as a black swan, but for example, metal traders did not consider the collapse in interest rates. That wasn't a black swan to them. It was a black swan to everybody else. So as long as you know whom to watch in, in global investors, you'll, you'll have advance warning. Um, that's, that's what we do. And I, I limit myself to only a couple of variables. It's very important. Angelo, I've mentioned this, this question. It's my favorite question. And every family member, uh, you either ask it of yourselves or you ask it of anyone who presumes to give you advice. And the, the question is this, what would you need to see to change your view? So if people say, Adam, um, say if, if, in an, if, a, if a, you get an, an analyst recommending, oh, buy undervalued oil stocks, right? Say that's the recommendation. You know, you get a big 15-page analysis why you should buy undervalued energy stocks. And then it's real simple. You just ask the following question. Okay, thank you so much. What would you need to say that I should be shorting energy stocks? And that will catch the analyst every single time. They, ne they, they don't have an answer to that. And if you don't know when you're wrong, you, won't, you can't possibly know when you're right. And again, it's so easy to make a recommendation. Buy this, sell that. And the question to keep in mind for yourself and to ask anyone else is what would you need to see to change your mind? In other words, what would you need to see to tell you <laughs> the reverse we're going on? So here, I'll go on record right now. What would you need to see, Adam, to tell you that um, the coronavirus threat were passed? Um, I'd say we look at jets relative to VT, J-E-T-S relative to VT. And uh, I mean, I could put an exact number on, on this. I, I can't right now because I'm talking to you, but right now it's, it's in roughly in the in the fifth percentile of its one year range right near the bottom you know if that were to rocket higher i say rocket i could give an exact number i, I can't calculate it now um but say if that hit you know the 25th percentile and we're rocketing higher i'd say the the coronavirus that would probably 
for the moment, gone. Um, what would I need to see to tell me interest rates were headed higher? I'd need to see copper divided by gold moving up. And, uh, and we're not seeing that. It's going down, accelerating to the downside. So the audience could understand a little bit of a framework of copper and gold in the interplay. Uh, copper is a useful industrial metal whose price tends to rise when the global economy expands. Gold, on the other hand, is somewhat of a less useful metal whose price tends to rise when investors are fearful about a contracting economy. Given that we are going through a contracting economy, would you recommend that families hedge a portfolio with gold, gold mining stocks, or simply any investment play in the gold? So, so gold, people think of gold as an inflation hedge. They're wrong about that. Um, gold is a deflation hedge. So gold is copper divided by, here's, here's a formula for the price of gold. Copper divided by the, the yield on the US 10 year. Copper divided by the yield on the US 10 year. Times some factor, K, K times that. But so if interest, if you look at that, copper divided by 10 year yields, if, if interest rates are going down, if the denominator is getting smaller, then gold is going up. So I will tell you that in a deflationary environment, the sectors that do very well are utilities, consumer staples, um, high yielding real estate, although you have to be careful about that now because of other problems, but utilities, staples, gold and gold miners um, um, do very well. Um, whereas material companies and energy stocks and financials do very badly in deflationary environments, very, very badly. What do you think of the role of cryptocurrencies going forward? Well, you know, the thing about cryptocurrencies, I remember as a teenager at Wharton, so eons ago, everything said about crypto was being said then about gold. And, and so crypto, yeah, supposedly it's a, it's a hedge for fiat currencies. And, and yet during this, this collapse in, um, in unprecedented collapse in stock prices, we haven't seen um, Bitcoin or the other cryptocurrencies going higher. If you were going to invest in crypto, um, and mind you, it has no economic value. And so if you were going to, the same principle applies, winners take all. So Bitcoin is worth more than all the other crypto coins combined. Bitcoin is worth more than all the others. In fact, it may be twice as much, but I know it's at least as much as all the other coins uh, involved, uh, uh, sorry, all the other crypto coins around. So if you wanted to have crypto exposure, then, then, it, then it would make sense to do it via Bitcoin. Um, but I, I don't see the economic value of, of, um, of, of Bitcoin. And you know, the, the, uh, I'm such an acolyte of, of, uh, of, of Buffett. And by the way, I'm gonna show everyone, because Angela, I'm gonna show you a, um, two books. So Angela, I, I, did I show you this book, How Not To Be Stupid? <laughs> it's your latest book. Yeah, so, so, so on the back, um, you can see the, the endorsement. So, yeah, it's from someone we may all know, his name is Warren Buffett. Yeah, so, <laughs> How Not to Be Stupid is loaded with good ideas and appropriate warnings. And um, so, so I, I, I've been a huge fan of Buffett. And also, and I'm, I'm going to make this offer, Angelo, to, to your, uh, your, your family members. This is another book. Warren and Charles' Bedtime Story by Warren and Adam Charlie's Martin. Warren and Charlie's Bedtime Story. And, um, and so this is... Um, 
a book I wrote uh, actually for Warren um, to celebrate his life and his investment philosophy and, and, and donate all proceeds to charity. And um, you know, what people don't realize about Buffett and Munger, who've been business partners for 60 years, is their method of investing is actually a logical conclusion. They're philosophers. People think of them as investors who happen to philosophize. That, that's actually a total misperception. They're actually philosophers who happen to invest. And, and they set themselves the following question. Given a world that is complex, and given a world where necessarily my information about it is incomplete, and given a world where even that information is that I do have may be mistaken, and given a world where I don't know what you know, and given a world where my reasoning is fallible, given those postulates, is it possible to invest and know with certainty that your wealth will grow? And, and the way they invest is actually the answer to that question. And so everything that they do is a logical conclusion based on those principles. So we're in a world, what do we know goes up in value? Um, we know certain things, we know human ingenuity um, increases. And we know that those that provide value in the world will continue to do well. So even if everything goes down, those that are providing value in a world, uh, a changing world, um, will continue to flourish. And um, so, yeah, that's, people should continue to do that. Invest in, I say that relative to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not producing anything. It's, it's not. In the light of that, you mentioned earlier certain specific companies in given sectors likely to do well. A Walmart, a Costco, an Amazon. You didn't mention it, but maybe with people being at home, a Netflix for entertainment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how else, and I know you don't know the specifics, I'm being very generic, but a significant family that's a family office that does some level of direct investing and some allocation to managers. During a time like this, are they better off being concentrated tactically or is incredible diversification not going to be best for generating longer term return, but a significant diversification should, in theory, hedge risk, or does everything correlate to one during the times that we're going through like COVID-19? Well, you know, so funny to use the word diversification. Um, uh, Warren and Charter, they're always so uh, canny. And, and uh, uh, I, I think, well, they both have said in, in different times in their in, inimitable way, uh, diversification is for those who don't know what they're doing. and which if you think about it, that's true. I don't know what's going to go up and what's going to go down. So I'll just spread my bets everywhere. And I'm not saying that you should, you should be, um, you know, concentrated in two or three positions. But if you want to outperform the market, you need to begin to make concentrated bets. And, and again, the way to play it would be if the stock market is going to do better, which companies are going to, I say companies as opposed to stocks, which companies are going to flourish in and have flourished before COVID and after? And it's real clear, Amazon, Costco, Walmart, and Shopify, that basket of stocks is going to pretty well represent the winners of U.S. consumers as well as tech, right? Shopify and Amazon give you some tech exposure. By the way, you mentioned Netflix, which is excellent, Angelo. Netflix is worth more than Disney. Think about that. Disney starts up its, its uh, streaming service and Netflix is worth more than Disney. Astonishing. And by the way, Disney, great company, great brands, great everything. 
and exposure to uh, consumer, you know, like their parks and things, that's going to be problematic. So a basket of the winningest stocks in the winningest sectors, just pick your, so for example, tech, like you could toss in, say, a Microsoft, toss in the winners in each sector. Within energies, most energy stocks doing really badly. XLE is the ETF on that. But take a look at NEE. Take a look at that stock relative to the market and relative to other energy stocks. So, so a basket of the winningest stocks will continue to outperform all the others. I think that's the that's always been Buffett and Munger's approach, and that's still the best way to invest. Um, by the way, they stay within their circle of competence. Right? One of their key things was given the other factors, right? I have incomplete information. I don't know what you know. I'm going to stick to the areas I know really well. And so family members can also do that, right? Family members, because of their expertise in different, in, in whatever area that led them to the creation of their wealth, um, have a, a deeper insight into that particular sector or industry. And they might, they might be able to, to, to do even better. But I'd say a, a bucket of concentrated, uh, of the winners has so outperformed all the others, um, the, the, the market as a whole. Again, don't think of the market as a whole. Don't think of stocks. Think of the winners and the losers. And the winners are going to keep winning and the losers are going to struggle. And even if things get, even when things get better, the winners will keep winning. That's what winners do. Um, so, so there. And how about commodities, whether a direct investor or more likely through a third party, a manager, is this an opportunity for families to look at? They need to increase their exposure to commodities. Well, again, the only in a deflationary world, which, which commodities do well? And gold. You could say gold and silver is a bit of an industrial metal um, also. So gold is the, the purest play. Um, I mean, I like oil is down, I don't know, what, 75% year to date. Copper down, I forget how much, 20 or 30%. Gold up, gold up, oil down. Um, so if you wanted exposure to commodities in a deflationary world, gold is the play um, and not industrial commodities. And you appear to, from your earlier comments to, have a little bit of putting the brakes on, unless you're perhaps a family with deep experiences uh, in investing in real estate. Well, real estate, you got to think twice about now, right? I mean, because companies are going to be downsizing. Even after we get through this, companies are going to go, oh, geez, when's the next coronavirus going to happen? Even if we get past this, it's we now have been warned, you know, that old saying, you know, first time shame on you, second time shame on me. It's okay, we might have missed the coronavirus, even though we, <laughs> we had SARS in 2002, we had avian flu, what, six, seven years after that. We've had these pandemic threats before. We had Ebola in Africa in 2014. And, and we were like that close from Ebola spreading beyond, beyond uh, Africa. And that's much more deadly than COVID-19. Oh, COVID-19, the, the fatality rate, look, any fatality rate is bad. Don't, don't get me wrong. But the, the, the current, in South Korea, it's, it's basically 1%. 1% of South Koreans who contract the disease die. And it's not random 1%. It's, you need to be, your immune system needs to be compromised in some way, some other factor um, that's, that's present. And so, so um, yeah, so we're going to see downsizing in real estate. We already know that young people are not, not getting married. They're not buying homes. Um, 
in New York last year, Angelo, um, storefront real estate in Manhattan. Manhattan is one of the prime real, real, uh, retail destinations in the world, right? Maybe a few other cities, I don't know, Hong Kong, I don't know, Dubai, Rome, Italy, Rome, Paris, London, aren't many cities, Tokyo, aren't many cities to match New York. 25% of retail storefront uh, in New York was vacant last year. 25% in the prime retail market in America, arguably one of the top few in the world, vacant. Um, so real estate, you really got to know what you're doing. The secular trends, by secular, I mean long term, are not auspicious right now. And, um, and again, if young people aren't buying homes, then old, older families that are looking to downsize the baby boomers when they retire, they're, they're not going to find millennials and Gen Zs ready to buy. That's a, that's a, they're, these are looming problems. And in terms of let's go to venture capital, you have somewhat of a potentially a favorable uh, outlook for tech, for healthcare, I would assume. Could that be an opportunity for wealthy families with long-term yes. capital? I, if, in consumer products, um, the, the tech is, the thing about tech, when you're investing in startups is it's unclear later which which of many horses is going to win that race and in consumer products so tech is is certainly worth considering consumer products um is another area which is um right now consumers and again you just look to the buying behavior of people you know, especially younger people, say under the age of 35, they're not going to traditional brands, they're going to brands that, that they believe in. And so, you know, like they're not gonna buy Snickers bars, they're gonna buy Kind bars. They're not gonna buy, you know, um, I don't know, uh, um, I'm trying to think of another brand. Uh, you know, they're, they're not gonna buy a Skippy peanut butter, they're gonna buy Justin's peanut butter. Right? They're going to brands with names and stories that they believe in. And so, by the way, this is also uh, a Munger Buffett principle of investing in things that people, we know people are going to eat. We know that. So buy companies that are providing food and related services or um, um, that we know people are going to continue to buy. Um, people are going to have to eat. They're, they're not going to have to buy another gizmo, um, but they will have to eat. So that's a, that's a promising area of, of um, consumer products for venture is really promising. There are all kinds of really cool trends that are going on now. Here's one, pet care. Pet ownership is exploding, exploding, not just for it was exploding before the coronavirus because younger people weren't getting married as quickly. So th they were tending to be single longer. So they were buying pets. And, and with the coronavirus, you can't really go out. You can't mingle as much. It's just amplifying a trend that was already there. So pet care is another interesting thing. Think about trends that were in place before coronavirus and are just being amplified by it. Those those companies and those sectors are going to continue to do extraordinarily well. It's more of a economist type question, but we'll throw it out there. Sure. Obviously, the Stimulus Act, the CARES Act, uh, trillions of dollars, significantly adding, adding to our deficit. Likely that number will go way up. We have tremendous unemployment. Uh, this is eventually this should lead to higher inflation and higher taxation. I mean, this is trending towards a big problem. But if you do nothing, I understand, if you don't bail out the airlines, if you don't help the people that live paycheck to paycheck, you could have anarchy and chaos. 
Yeah, you have to for sure no human being should worry about food and medical care and basic shelter, right? Really, that shouldn't, by the way, I say that as the, mo as the fiercest libertarian, you know, quasi-anarchist, um, capitalist, no human being should, should, should fear about food or, or shelter or, or medical care. Um, now that said, so th that has to be taken care of. That's a that's a for sure, and that got massive bipartisan support, like ninety six, oh something like that in the Senate. And uh, now other stimulus member, mm -mm, other stimulus measures, it's unclear what should be done for that. And I I think that there's a a panic mode again in my book, How Not to Be Stupid that every, our political, uh, I don't want to say political, that's going to sound like I'm, I'm singling out somebody, but um, our leaders, this isn't, this is a bipartisan just in general, are, are reacting rather than thinking things through. So for example, uh, the Fed a week, a week before, this is a few months ago, a week before their scheduled, um, FOMC meeting lowered interest rates by 50 bips the week before. It was a panic move. Like, oh my gosh, let's lower interest rates. So there's a, a sense among the people that our leaders are reacting and, and panicking. And again, I don't, they're doing the best they can, but I think what's needed now is a, a pause and to reflect. Americans need to know that they don't have to worry about food and medical care and, and shelter for the short term. And then we need some real hard thinking and planning rather than just rushing to throw uh, this measure or that, like, oh, we've got to support this industry and that. And it's, it's random and the, the perils are too great um, and, and, uh, to, to, to get this wrong. Uh, I could line up 10 different economists, all with a great uh, educational background, perhaps well-known. Let's assume they have different perspectives, and they will. Is there a fallacy to relying on expert opinions, economists being one, being more theorist, and not actually in the trenches being real investors? Well, in, um, economists... If there was one group that you should fade in investing terms, that means take the opposite position of its, its, uh, its economists. But the most, really, if there were one group of, 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 of experts that you should not pay attention to, it's economists. Um, remember that, the, I'm not going to say which one, but I had... I, the head of the U.S. Treasury, when I was saying interest rates were headed lower because metal traders were saying they're going to go lower, he was an economist. He still is. <laughs> and um, so, so economists have models that tell us the way the world should be. Metal traders look at actual buying and selling of, of real things in the world. And so why, what would you listen to economists about? They are the ones that have been recommending lowering interest rates. It hasn't helped. And, and by the way, when, when economists QE, when it first started, I think it was November 29th, 2008. Um, November 29th, I think was the date Bernanke announced QE. It's either November 29th or October 29th, 2008. Um, and the market has been flooded with trillions and trillions of dollars. And the economists believed that businesses would invest in, in plant and equipment and, 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 and people would, would be encouraged to invest and build things. And what's happened is the money has been used by Wall Street on stock buybacks. And, um, 
So, so, so the stock market has done well, the US stock market. Global equities outside the US peaked 12 years ago, Angelo, 12 years ago, global equities. Um, and uh, so even, again, even before the coronavirus, global equities peaked 12 years ago and US equities peaked on February 19th, like two months ago. So um, yeah, d d economists, what are they? Again, the, the question to ask an economist is this, if a, an economist says As interest rates are going higher, you say, okay, thank you so much, Mr. Nobel Laureate. What would you need to see to tell me that interest rates were headed lower? They wouldn't have an answer to that. They'd say, well, my model is saying they're going higher. You know, my model with a thousand inputs and multivariate calculus equations. Thanks so much. I'm going to follow the metal traders on that one. A little bit about making a decision, thinking and decision making. Mm -hmm. You can make what appears to be a good decision with the data that you believe in and a process to an outcome that you believe in. And it could still be wrong. It doesn't mean your decision making is flawed, although perhaps in certain markets it does need to be adapted. Mm -hmm. uh, so markets are effectively incredibly irrational, especially in the short term. Uh, how do you come to grips with developing the data that I'm gonna use Here's my process, and I know I'm making a good decision, but I'm not 100% sure, especially in the short run, that I'm going to be right. Well, that's such a good question, Angelo. And I reduce, for my clients, I reduce the world down to a handful of variables. There, I've just stated, I could, here, I'll give you three indicators. If you said, Adam, just, you can only watch three indicators to tell you what was going on with the American um, economy, it would be uh, copper divided by gold, that's DBB divided by GLD, those are the ETFs. I would look at LQD divided by IEF, that's investment grade corporate bonds versus treasuries, and XLY divided by XLP, uh, which is uh, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. That Everything I need to know about the economy, I would know from those three things. You know, like a doctor, when you go to a, a doctor, they take your temperature, they take your, your blood pressure, right? They strap that thing on and then they have that little mallet, they tap your knee if you've got reflexes. And based on that, that and they'll, they'll dig deeper, but those three things for the economy um, will tell me how what to expect and how things are going to unfold. Um, you don't need lots of variables. And so the thing to do Angelo, is to state what would I need to see to change my view. I already know my view. Coronavirus still present, right? Jets divided by JETS divided by VT, still near record lows, like right at record lows. Um, um, I know the copper divided by gold at all time lows. So I know these things and all I need to do every day is just check to see is it, has it changed? Otherwise my view is the same as it was yesterday. It's kind of like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs with the, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, you know, and every day the queen would ask, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror would say, you are, your highness, your hotness, and then one day the mirror said, oh, well, actually there's, there's a new hottie in the, in the forest. And so I know, mirror, mirror on the wall, that we're in a deflationary environment, low to no growth. And, and it would, I would need to see a change in one of those indicators to tell me, oh, things are different. Otherwise, they're the same as they were yesterday. I, I, don't, I spend very little time looking at markets. And so you gave some key indicators and currently that's part of your process. And that's subject to change as you evaluate many different things relative to what you do. I suppose my question is, uh, and it's a very broad one, answer it as you want. How does Adam Robinson make decisions? By just that, by, by reducing the world 
to a handful of variables or any situation to a handful of variables. And the, the reason that's so important is, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes, possibly my favorite quote, uh, certainly a top five, is Charlie Munger's take a simple idea and take it seriously. That's the key to success really in anything. And your family members, they know from their own businesses and, 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 and what led to the creation of their family fortunes is always a simple idea taken seriously. And so you want to reduce the complexity of the world down to a few things that you can monitor and think about. If it's more than that, the more complex you get, the more you suffer from confirmation bias and the more you suffer from, from just confusion. There's just too many variables. Take a look at anything that, that Buffett and Munger have ever said. It's always real simple. Keep it simple. Reduce it down to a few variables and watch those. Uh, some questions that have come in from our live audience be in chat, and I'm going to shorten this one up quite a bit. And I kind of asked it a couple of minutes ago sure. with the deficit growing by trillions and trillions and trillions and more trillions of dollars to come. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, won't we hit a point, potentially a Zimbabwe of hyperinflation? Well, you know, the thing about it is that every country is doing that. <laughs> yes. Every country is. And by the way, the same thing when I was a teenager back at Wharton, I remember reading about, ooh, the price of gold is going to reach $100,000 because look at the U.S. government printing money. Yeah, every country's printing money. And the thing about inflation is there needs to be demand, right? For there to be, there needs to be a lot of money and then that money has to go somewhere. I have to bid up the price of things like bid up the price of oil or bid up the price of, of, of human labor, right? That's what produces inflation. If there's a ton of money, but no one wants anything, there's no inflation. It's real simple. I could have a billion dollars in dollar bills in this room here. I'm, I'm, I'm staying uh, in West Hollywood at uh, Petite Hermitage. I, I live in Tribeca, but I'm out here for now. And uh, I, I, could, I could stack this room full of uh, bills, but if I don't want anything, there's no inflation. So inflation occurs when you have lots of money and that money is used to buy things. Where has there been inflation? I'll tell you where, stock prices. That's where the money has gone, to stock prices and bond prices not to things. Commodity prices have been plummeting. But do you get inflation because currency is devalued? Well, all currencies are devalued, right? So if the dollar is devalued by 50% and every other country's currency is devalued by 60%, the dollar has gone up in value relative to other currencies. It's all a relative game. By the way, and. I, I'm, I'm going to hazard, a, a, I'm going to throw some things to watch for, the, you know, family members. Watch the Euro franc. It's uh, the Euro versus the Swiss franc. Watch that currency in the next couple of months. Something's going to happen in Switzerland. I don't know what. That's my spider sense. Watch that. I say that because everything is relative. So the Euro the euro, which is the currency of the euro zone, versus the Swiss franc is, um, is, um, is it multi-year lows? And the last time the Swiss National Bank, that happened, the Swiss National Bank does things to keep money out of Switzerland. Like they'll raise the fee for deposits. Angelo, you know about that, right? In Switzerland, if you want money in, in a Swiss bank account, they charge you half a percent a year, maybe even more, than that, like seven tenths of a percent, something like that. You have to pay. You don't, you don't get interest. <laughs> you pay for the privilege of lending them money. And um, so, um, yeah, I, we're not going to have hyperinflation here until we have, we'll see it elsewhere first. 
That's the thing. U.S. currency being devalued, yeah, so is every other country faster than ours. What do you think of investing in muni bonds? Muni bonds are real dangerous right now. Um, uh, you know, again, I've got you on screen, so I can't look at, at my um, at, at, at my monitor. Uh, you know, I could I could look at this right now, but I can't because I'm looking at, at your handsome face. And the <laughs> the um, muni bonds are dangerous because mm, they. Mm, because it's not clear that municipalities are going to be solvent. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, that pretty much it, it, that basically it says it all. It introduces oh. another risk, a huge risk. And, um, you know, we might see, again, I'm going to say it here. I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just saying it's a not insignificant possibility that there would be a, a moratorium on U.S. Uh, interest rate payments on um, on its treasury obligations. I, I put the probability at that at mm, right now, 25% in the next two years. Now, by the way, when that happens, um, paradoxically, bonds are likely to go up in value. Um, in on August 5th, 2011, Standard and Poor's downgraded U.S. treasuries for the first time since World War II, downgraded U.S. Treasuries on August 5th, 2011. They said the U.S. government, less able to meet its interest rate obligations, they downgraded it. And, uh, and I told my clients, buy the heck out of Treasuries. And they said, yeah, but Treasuries just got downgraded. I said, yeah, think about it. It's always a relative play. If, um, if things are so bad in the world that the U.S. government is having a trouble meeting its obligations, well, then the rest of the world is way worse, which means we're, we're in a risky world. What's the safest thing in the world right now to in, for investors? U.S. Treasury bonds. And they, they, they vaulted like they were up 19% in five weeks. And they're up still a lot more from that, like in the intervening years. So we, we're going to see some outrageous counterintuitive things. Um, moves by my, my, my two front runners for that are the Swiss National Bank and, uh, and our own government. Um, so, yeah, this change. What's your greatest fear right now? Well, well, I personally have no fears, but I'm, you mean for the world? That, yes. That, that, that we will, that, that our leadership will, and this is not, I don't, I define stupidity as overlooking or dismissing conspicuously crucial information. Stupidity is not the opposite of intelligence, Angelo. It's the cost of intelligence operating in a complex environment. That's why Buffett endorsed my book. He said, you've got to get this out there. And people, when, they're, when certain conditions are present, they, are, they enter what I call the, the stupid zone. It, you could be Albert Einstein. If the conditions are present, such as the conditions in the world, you will be making stupid decisions. And that's what's going on right now. You know, the, the Hippocratic Oath is first, do no harm. And, and my fear is for the world that we're doing harm. And we need to take a step back. The American people need to be assured that they're going to be able to eat, not have to worry about being evicted, or, or, um, and that their medical needs will be taken care of. That we're America. Like, damn straight, we can do that. And then we need to pause and think about how to how to grow in a sustainable way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna circle back to what I stated at the beginning. The modern world was predicated on the continual accumulation of debt. The continual accumulation of debt. And we never paid it down. We kept piling up more debt. Debt works as long as you can grow your way out of it. But it's now the growth is accelerating to the 
downside. And that's a big problem because we're left with the debt. And, and that, that's going to be a painful readjust, readjusting. Um, you know, really the whole world is, we've had a built-in requirement of growth at all costs, growth at all costs. And this is where we are right now. Growth at all costs, this is the cost. And so, um, so we need to rethink things. That's my greatest fear, that, that instead of slowing down and, and thinking our, our leaders, corporate and political, are being forced to make quick decisions. They're being forced to by people and by public opinion. They need not to. They need to disappear for two or three weeks, whatever, and come up with a plan as opposed to responding to, you know, this commentator or that. Like, why aren't you doing more? There are certain trends that were inevitable and happening, but that COVID-19 could speed up. You mentioned some of them earlier. When things so-called go back to normal, uh, how companies hire, the potential of more remote workers mm -hmm. uh, were being a transition with remote workers into likely entrepreneurs developing much, much better augmented reality than we have now, possibly manufacturing coming more back to the U.S., which might be a positive in mm -hmm. multiple different ways, not only from employment, sure. but real estate. But like you said, what's going to be the next virus? And are you going to see more, are robotics going to be pushed more to the forefront? Could our future be very different, good or bad? three to five years out? For sure, it's going to be very different. That's a given, right? We know that's the case. And, and so, by the way, these are times of unprecedented opportunity. If you're on the right side and you know, you know, it was Wayne Gretzky said, um, a good hockey players skate to where the puck is. Great hockey players skate to where it's going to be. It's real clear where the, the direction of things are going. And by the way, certain things are unclear, but certain things are very clear. Consumer behavior going to change radically. Um, uh, people are downsizing their needs. Um, they're downsizing their families. Um, they're, and, and we know the demographics, the population demographics, that's going to continue to shrink. That's a given. So even based on those givens, you can invest around what you know. We don't have to speculate on things. I don't know, for example, whether, whether this particular technology or that will do better five or 10 years from now, or whether another technology will supplant that. But I do know people are gonna eat, that's up for sure. People are not gonna be buying as much, that's for sure. Um, and what they buy, what they spend their money on will be very different. And so the quality of goods, likely that's gonna increase. You're not gonna be buying as much, but what you buy, it's gonna mean more to you. That's clear, those trends were in place before coronavirus. And so we don't need, Angelo, you and I, to speculate on what might be. We already know those trends are in place. And so, the, again, unprecedented opportunities to be on the right side of those trends. Uh, this could be a great change <laughs> from currently the, I guess you could call it nationalism. And you, again, you hinted at it relative to aging populations around the world, where mm -hmm. it's actually not as bad here in the US, but that trend would likely get worse. So one question could be with growth at all costs, could you see the U.S. and other countries rethinking their immigration ideas that they actually want young, vibrant people to come to this country uh, to contribute, to, be, to help with building our manufacturing base, to making us younger? I mean, who's going to help support all these deficits and social security <laughs> expenditures and all that we're going to have for years and years to come? Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's a... Um America was always a place, everything is, mm, Angel, everything is an answer to a question, all human things. Uh, this coffee is an answer to a question. What can I drink that's, that's gonna give me a little pep and 
and uh, I like the taste of it. Um, this hotel where I am, Petit Hermitage, is an answer to a question I had, and and which is where can I be like bunker um, during this uh, shutdown? And that was an answer. And America is an answer to a question. Has always been if you want to if you want a a place to go where your skills can find expression and you will be rewarded for those skills and value you contribute, America was the answer in the world. And so we still want those people able to contribute. I am sure that's what America always was in the world. And um, so we're gonna have to rethink a lot. Um, and again, those who contribute and provide value will do very well in this world. Um, yeah. Uh, going back to an investment question, uh, luxury companies, $10,000 purses, expensive jewelry, is this, an, <laughs> I don't, is this an opportunity potentially to short what looks like it's gonna be a challenged industry for a while to come? I, you know, I, would, I would look at those you know, and, and, and think about, by the way, even brands, Everything is an answer to a question. So when someone buys a, an Hermes scarf or, or a Chanel handbag or whatever it is, and these are great brands, these are great companies that produce great quality, what question did the consumer ask himself or herself in buying this? And I think the nature of conspicuous consumption is going to, is going to change a lot right now. And, um, and again, young people, millennials and Gen Z's are already turning their back. If you know anyone under the age of, of 30, certainly 20, like old brands are just ridiculous. And, and so I mean that in, they have no attachment to those brands. So I'm not, I would Again, I'm not providing investment advice, but those brands face a challenging environment where people are, do I need a, a lot of things? By the way, conspicuous consumption, if we're not out in public as much as we used to be, and clearly that's already the case, well, then heck, it doesn't really matter what kind of handbag you have or what kind of scarf. And I... Again, young people and millennials and Gen Zs have already been moving in this direction. So the 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 challenge for the those you know the Tiffany's and the LVMHs and such in the world and the Hermeses and these are great companies, great products. I don't know. I I'd have to take a look at the stock prices and and tell you what not what Adam thinks, but what the market is thinking right now. I have two final questions that will take us in a different direction. I'm going to start with one of them. What can we do as global citizens, taking this time of, for many of us, isolation, to expand as a person, spiritually, being creative, self-educating, if we're business owners and we see it <laughs> being devastated, how could we adapt to a new world? Well, you know, one of the great things that I, I love, Angela, about, about your association and your mission and families in general is they they have a, a historical view on things multi-generation they're not thinking about short term next quarter they're looking multiple generations ahead and so so this is an opportunity for everyone um, certainly families and and individuals and corporations to think where we're going to be x X years from now, I'd propose this in a different context of what's your perfect day like? I mean, there's an exercise we can all do is forget the rest of the world, like forget what might or might not happen. And just what would your perfect day be like if you could, you know, from the moment you wake up till the moment you go to sleep, just a perfect day, say three years from now. And, and, um, and then design a world, because by the way, everyone's asking that question. Everyone right now is going, oh, you know what? I don't need as much as I, I did before. So what do I need? 
every individual is asking that question. And, and, and so should every company, right? And if you answer that question correctly, you will do very well, very well in the world to come. Think of it right now, Angelo. Here's a metaphor for family members is, is um, we're in the early stages of a flood. Say, I'm gonna mix metaphors here, but we're not even at the bottom of the first inning. It started to rain and the floodwaters are rising and we've all retreated into our individual arcs and, and wondering what's it gonna be like when we can go back outside and we can get off the arc. And, and so that's the thing. Think about when we come down off the plank and the floodwaters recede, what's the world gonna be like? It's not a back to normal. That normal was never sustainable. It was predicated on unlimited growth. And that's not there anymore. So we know if we look five years, 10 years, a couple of generations ahead, the demographics are already there, shrinking population. There's nothing to be done about that. And we already know this has been a massive experiment. People have learned, I can do without. So what are they, what are they gonna say I can't do without? I can't do without contact. I can't do without my basic needs being met. I can't do without quality. And by the way, I can't do without certain indulgences, right? We like to treat ourselves. So what kind of indulgences are people going to permit themselves? And, and if you answer those questions correctly, this is times of extraordinary opportunity. If you're on the right side of it, extraordinary. I am going to have one final century. I am going to have one final question for Adam, and then he'll share ways that we could learn more about him and his thoughts. And for some of you that may want to engage from a business perspective, before I get to that, I do have to do a little bit of business. I'll try to keep it just one minute. Effectively, it's going to be a sponsor read, which is me and my organization. Uh, so many of you know me as the host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office podcast, which I love to do and have great people like Adam on. I'm also the founder and CEO of Family Office Association. We're a global membership organization dedicated to families of great, great wealth and their single family offices. We do a significant amount of original proprietary content, arguably more than anyone else in the world, dedicated to such families, and we host a significant number of global events. Now, the physical events are on hold until we get more clarity and direction, but one day, whether it's two months, 12 months, or 18 months, physical events will come back. But we've been doing daily, daily meetings Monday through Friday for our members online, sometimes as peer-to-peer, -peer, what we call a mastermind series of families only, and sometimes with great guests like Adam today and many, many others launching our online network for members to communicate 24 seven anywhere in the world. So I've in building on what Adam just said, I needed to adapt what I do. I can't keep doing the same thing or I'm not gonna have a sustainable business. One day, part of the old, hopefully sooner rather than later will come back, but that'll be mixed with how we've evolved as an organization more global in, a, in our own way, more digital and changing the value added and benefits. So those of you that would like to find out a little more at the end of this podcast, I'll give various ways that you could reach out to me. And those of you that are already members, of course, I appreciate your great support and look forward to your feedback about, especially during these times, how we could do even more and we're always looking to get better. Adam, if I had one Final question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. What recommendation would you give to the global youth, the Generation Z? They're in grammar school, they're in high school, maybe in college. Mm -hmm. uh, they're looking at this and I'm assuming they're afraid. Uh, yeah. How could you give them a little bit of hope for the future? Well, here's the thing. Um, boy, Angelo, I am such a huge fan of yours. And, and by the way, just I'm gonna just, and you only give yourself a minute. I just want to shout out to you also. You know, one of the great things you do, apart from, from providing expertise to your family members, is you bring the family members together themselves and, and, and facilitate communication among family members. And that's so important right now. 
to keep communication open and for family members themselves to share ideas and perspectives. So, so Gen Z, I don't, I don't believe in hope and hope is a passive, and I, I say that you and I are on the same page, Angelo, but instead of hope, which is passive, I, I like everyone should be more active and something that Gen Z's really need to do right now is decide what kind of world they want. And it's not because really this is the first time in, I don't know, certainly in my lifetime and arguably um, in, in centuries that young people had no idea what was gonna, gonna happen. Even during the depression, we thought, okay, well, it's bad economic times, but business will eventually get back to normal. This is, I think, the first time, again, certainly in my lifetime, uh, that young people are faced with, there's no normal. So good, decide what kind of world you want. And, and, then, and then work towards creating that. That's really key. Decide what you want. The world is, is clearly not working. So decide what kind of world you want. That's what young people should do. There should be like a, a, a global youth congress where we just where young people under the you know Gen Zs and millennials just decide what kind of world, not growth at all costs, what kind of world isn't based on the accumulation of debt. You know, the, the average debt, by the way, in the world right now is is roughly thirty-two thousand dollars per human being. Uh, including babies, including the elderly in nursing homes, including everybody, including someone earning $5 a week somewhere in the world. It's $32,000 per human being. Way too much debt. That's not sustainable. So young people, decide what kind of world you want. Like that's a start, just a vision. Don't worry about how you're going to get there. Start there. That's an excellent comment. In a couple of seconds, I'm going to ask Adam to give ways that you can learn more about his services and reach him. And again, I highly recommend, especially on Twitter, but all social media, where he posts practically what appears to be daily. And it's just so insightful from a business, from an investing, and from a personal perspective. Uh, Adam is really someone, and he's going to be very modest, but someone who really is a significant thinker, uh, is highly creative, and gives an opportunity for uh, a family office, a hedge fund manager, a sovereign wealth fund. I mean, he's someone who's at the top of his game. He's one of the best of the best at what he does. And he only has limited capacity relative to relationships that he works with. Uh, so, you know, it's an opportunity to really have a chance to engage with Adam, especially during the trying times we're going through. Is he going to be the most cost effective option? Absolutely not. Uh, he's someone, again, he's at the top of the mountain in terms of what he does. But if you're a family with resources to protect and hedge and looking for opportunities shorter term and longer term, it's hard to go this alone. And having the right guidance and advice for someone like Adam, uh, I think is going to be incredibly valuable for anyone as an investor who has the resources to do so. I realize it's not going to be for everyone. And Adam actually gives a lot away for free in a podcast like this and on Twitter and social media. Uh, but an opportunity for a family to more significantly engage, he's just the best. And Adam, for those that would like to find out more, how could they find out more about you and your organization? Well, I guess uh, that just you could write to me, adam at robinsonglobalstrategies.com. And... Uh, or you can DM me on Twitter or uh, Instagram on, um, it's I am Adam Robinson. And then you just shoot me a, a direct message or Adam at Robinson Global Strategies. And I, I do, I'm only too happy to advise, you know, especially as you know, Angelo, your, your family members and just, we can just talk and, uh, and I'll certainly point you in the right direction if, if, I'm, not, if I'm not the person for you and these really are unprecedented times and it's um first do no harm <laughs> really think um 
cautiously and before acting right now. So thank, thank you for that. And uh, really, anyone has any questions about anything? Um, just, I'm, I'm only too happy to talk, as I have well, been here. <laughs> You're very kind with your time, Adam. Uh, everyone, in concluding, I'm Angelo Robles, a host of Angelo Robles' Effective Family Office Podcast and the founder and CEO of Family Office Association. I, too, am very active, especially now more than ever on social media from Instagram, where I'm Family Office Association, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, which is probably my most significant. And now as we're doing more videos, my YouTube channel is rather extensive, and I got a great name because I registered it many, many years ago when YouTube just launched, and it relates to what I do. It simply is Family Office. So I'm Family Office on YouTube. You can learn more about me at FamilyOfficeAssociation.com or even AngeloRobles.com. Feel free to reach out anytime. Adam, it's been fantastic. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Uh, everyone, thank you for being a live audience today and those that will eventually see it on YouTube or on an Apple or a Stitcher podcast on Android. I hope you enjoyed it. Adam, again, thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Angelo. Thank you.